Ferentia's grandfather is surprised to see that the prince is here. Ferentia is also surprised, and as she's clasping onto her grandpa, she wonders what Astana is thinking since he made such a fuss, saying he'd never step into the mansion again. Astana then says, That day when I returned to the palace, I was scolded by my mother. He adds that he'd like to use this opportunity to apologize for his rudeness. Ferentia is surprised upon hearing this statement and starts thinking about how even though it's her birthday party, since it's being held under the Lombardi name, it's unlikely that the Empress didn't expect this many people to attend. Ferentia is also angry by the fact that the Empress sent the first prince to apologize in front of all of these people and the fact that he actually listened and came. Ferentia thought he was just stupid, but now she wonders if she underestimated him. One of Astana's butlers then reminds him about the gift he brought for Ferentia. Upon remembering, he gives Ferentia the gift and wishes her a happy birthday. As Ferentia is opening the gift, she is amazed by the gift and thanks him for it. However, she really didn't want to accept it. Astana is glad that Ferentia likes the gift that his mother personally picked for her. He also asks her if he can put it on for her as a way to congratulate her. Ferentia agrees. She also calls him a bastard in her head and believes that he's persistent. Astana then starts to put the necklace on Ferentia. As he's putting it on, Ferentia starts to think about how she can't believe that the Empress gave her such a precious thing. She believes that it must be because of the huge success of the business between the Lombardi and the Angenasis, and how this must be a symbol of gratitude towards the three brothers. As Ferentia is looking at the necklace on her, she realizes that at this point, her birthday is just being used to show off the Empress's political prowess and wealth. Ferentia's grandpa then says, We've been delayed for a moment due to the sudden visit of a guest. However, we cannot keep our other guests waiting any longer, so let the banquet begin. Let us all raise our glasses. Ferentia's grandpa continues by making a toast to congratulate Ferentia on her eighth birthday. After the toast, everyone cheers and congratulates Ferentia. Ferentia's grandfather then pats Ferentia and tells her that she should go eat something as well, instead of standing still. He adds that he told the chef to show extra care since it's her birthday. Upon hearing this statement, Ferentia realizes that her grandpa noticed that she wasn't in a good mood and changed the topic for her. She also mentions to herself that she shouldn't care so much about such a trivial matter. As for the necklace, she can just put it away. Ferentia then takes off the necklace given to her by Astana and puts it back inside the box. As she starts to walk away, she further thinks that it's been a while since they've had a banquet, so she shouldn't pay any attention to the first prince and have fun. However, Astana starts following her. Upon noticing this, Ferentia questions him about why he's following her. Astana replies, Huh? Oh, don't mind me. I'm not doing this because I necessarily want to be with you. I'm going to stay around for a bit and go back, so just shut up and stay still. Ferentia gets slightly angry from hearing this response and believes that from the looks of it, this is probably one of the Empress's orders. She also wonders if he really thinks she's just going to be pushed around. Ferentia then apologizes to Astana since she's going to be staying with her cousins. She adds that she doesn't have time to be with him, and if he's looking for a playmate, then he can look for someone else. Suddenly, Belazak interrupts their discussion by calling out to Astana and stating to him that it's a shame that they weren't able to socialize last time due to that disgraceful incident. He adds that if it's all right with him, they could show him around the mansion. He further asks him about what he says about that. Astana responds, Huh? That's right. Well, dot 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 it wasn't that much of a shame, really. As Belazak is fidgeting, he nervously starts to laugh and replies, I, if that's so, then that's good. Meanwhile, Ferentia starts to get even angrier and thinks that Belazak is a coward. She believes that Belazak, who'd pull someone's hair in a heartbeat, is groveling just because he's in front of the prince. All of a sudden, Astana grabs onto Ferentia's arm and tells her that frankly, she's ignorant and arrogant, but she's still better than those two boys. Upon hearing this statement, Ferentia and Belazak are shocked. Ferentia also starts thinking about how Atana is a crazy bastard and that she doesn't need his approval. She further wonders what is up with his proud face. Belazak is also very angry and starts to look at Ferentia. 
Ferentia notices this and starts to wonder why he's glaring at her as the one who said all that wasn't her, but the first prince. This makes Ferentia even more angry, and also wonders if his anger is targeted towards the weak. Shannonette then questions Ferentia about what she's doing over here and mentions to her to come this way. She adds that since it's her birthday party, she should open the presents. Upon hearing this statement, Ferentia starts to think about how she's free and is glad that her auntie saved her right in time. Ferentia then says, Th That's right, I've forgotten about opening the presents. She also states to Astana that she must go now, as she has things to do. Astana questions her about where she's going. However, Belazak and Astalyu grab him as they want him to stay with them. Astana gets angry upon the boys clasping onto him and commands them to let him go this instant. Meanwhile, the guests are watching this occur and start to laugh and giggle as they believe that the Lombardi and the Imperial family have such a strong bond. As Ferentia is walking to where her gifts are, she can't believe that there would be a time when Belazak's brazenness and Astalyu's brawn would come of use. She also believes that it's a bit embarrassing to have to act like a child in front of all of these people, and she couldn't believe that she has to act like a child that is excited by getting gifts. The twins then start to give Ferentia gifts to open and are restless. As she grabs a gift from one of the twins, she starts thinking about how she'll gladly do this a hundred times if this will allow her to get away from the first prince. However, Ferentia feels like this is still a task that is tedious and decides to just open a few of the small gifts. Ferentia then starts to open up her gifts. Some of the gifts turn out to be shoes, a book, a ring, a necklace, and a watch. However, one of the gifts turns out to be a tiara. The twins are amazed upon seeing this gift and pressure Ferentia to try it on. Once Ferentia puts it on, the twins state to her that it's pretty and how it suits her so well. The guests are also amazed and believe that it's cute that the next generation of Lombardi are getting along very well. They add that seeing them all together like this really makes them look like little angels. As Ferentia is smiling, she starts to think about how at first she thought it was a bit annoying, but now that she's doing it, it's more fun than she thought. This experience also makes her realize that the anticipation of what's in each of the boxes is why people open up random boxes. Suddenly, a little child attempts to hand Ferentia a gift and requests her to open it up next. As Ferentia is grabbing the gift, we learn that the little child's name is Craney and he's Astalia's little brother. Ferentia is relieved that he hasn't been tainted by his family yet and believes that it must be because he's so young. As she starts to open the gift that Craney handed to her, she starts to wonder what's inside the box. She believes that since the box is big and light, it must be a doll. All of a sudden, someone shouts out Ferentia's name. Ferentia looks over to see who called out to her and realizes that it's her daddy. She then runs over to hug him. As she's hugging him, she is amazed by what he's wearing and mentions to him that he looks so handsome. Ferentia's grandfather also tells her father that he's late. Ferentia's father responds, I'm sorry, I must have kept you waiting. I'm sorry, father. I tried my best to come as fast as I could. Ferentia's grandfather replies, All right, now that you've arrived, everyone's here. Now let us head over that way. Upon hearing this response, Ferentia's father agrees with his father. Suddenly, Astana calls out to Ferentia's father. Ferentia's grandfather asks him about why he called out to his son. Astana apologizes and states that he has something to pass along. Ferentia's grandfather is surprised upon hearing this and tells Astana that if it's a gift for Ferentia, he believes that he's already given it to her earlier. Astana then takes out a letter and explains that this isn't for Ferentia. Upon seeing the purple envelope, Visa comes to a halt and is shocked as he knows that there's only one person who could have used such a color. Astana then mentions to Ferentia's father that the empress told him to deliver this invitation that is to a banquet to him. He further requests Ferentia's father to make sure that he attends. Upon seeing the invitation, Ferentia realizes that she's finally going to meet the second prince, Perez, at the palace. We then see the next scene where Shannonette is giving Ferentia an etiquette lesson. However, Ferentia is struggling to follow her instructions. Once her lesson is over, Ferentia falls to the ground and starts complaining to Shannonette that this lesson is so hard. 
Shannonette states to her that it's harder because she was moving slowly. She then demonstrates to Ferentia on how it should be done and tells her to watch carefully. Upon seeing the demonstration, Ferentia is amazed by Shannonette's elegance. She mentions to her aunt that she's so elegant and splendid and asks her how is she so perfect. Shannonette touches Ferentia's nose and replies, with practice. She adds that she's serious and how there's no other way to improve than to practice. Especially for her since she's still small and lacks strength, she must practice until her body becomes accustomed to it. Ferentia is disappointed upon hearing this, but understands what her auntie is saying. She also starts to think about how ever since she came back, she's been trying really hard to eat and sleep a lot, yet she still can't seem to gain weight. She wonders if it's because she takes after her father. The twins are also in the background and question their mother about how much longer they have to wait as they would like to play with Ferentia. Upon hearing the twins' question, Ferentia calls them fools in her head and believes that it's a miracle that they were waiting so quietly throughout the etiquette lesson. The twins then start to whine since they are bored and are starting to get tired. Meanwhile, Shannonette questions Ferentia if she understands the proper way to curtsy now. Ferentia responds, Yes, I'll do my best to practice. Please check on me again tomorrow. Ferentia also believes that in any case, in order for her to not be a laughing stock in front of the emperor and empress, she must perfect her curtsy at the very least, especially to make sure that the damned first prince doesn't laugh at her. Shannonette then pats Ferentia on the head and mentions to her that she always wanted a daughter exactly like her. As the two of them are watching the twins roll around on the ground, she asks Ferentia about how did she end up being the mother of those naughty twins. Ferentia replies, Ah, oh, I can come visit more often. Suddenly, the twins' father barges into the room and calls out to Shannonette. This causes the twins to jolt up as they realize that it's their father. The twins then hug their father as they are happy to see that their father has come back really early today. They also ask their father if this means that he can play with them until bedtime. Their father embraces the twins and calls them rascals. Shannonette also welcomes her husband back home. The twins' father then says, I came back early since I didn't have much work today. He also questions his wife if she and the children have been well. Upon seeing this interaction, Ferentia is amazed and can't believe that she's seeing such a warm and normal couple within the family. All of a sudden, the twins' father notices Ferentia and questions her about how she has been. Ferentia responds, Hello, Uncle Vestian. Ferentia's uncle responds, Oh, that's right. I'm sorry that I couldn't make it to your birthday party last time. I had a lot of work that day. Ferentia reassures him not to worry and how she really appreciated the gift that he sent her. We then learn that Vestian Schultz is Shannonette's husband, as well as the man who loved her to the point of volunteering himself to come live with her family. Ferentia's uncle then states to Ferentia that she sure has a big heart. He adds that he shall give her something much better for her next birthday. As he's patting Ferentia on the head, Ferentia is amazed that he will give something even better than the last gift on her next birthday. We also learn that although Ferentia's uncle is not a member of the Lombardi family, he is in charge of several small businesses within the family, and he is considered to be quite capable. Ferentia's uncle then calls out to his wife, and as he's hugging her, he asks her if they should try for a pretty girl like Ferentia too. Shannonette starts to blush upon hearing this question, and we further learn that Ferentia's uncle and aunt are the rare lovebirds within the Lombardi family. As Ferentia's uncle is embracing his wife, Shannonette tells him to stop it as the children are listening. However, Ferentia's uncle laughs and questions her, so what? Ferentia also slowly starts to walk away and mentions to the family that she has somewhere to be. As Ferentia is leaving, she takes a look at the family and starts to wonder why such a lovely couple like that got divorced three years from now. We then see the next scene where Ferentia is playing around with the medicine bottle and asks Estira if this is the finished result. Estira confirms that it is and how she finished it a few days ago but brought it today since she told her to. Upon hearing this response, Ferentia says, Yep, yep, that's right. Thank you so much, Estira. If I put it in my pocket, no one will know what kind of medicine it is. Estira is so meticulous. 
Estira is speechless at first upon hearing this response, but then questions Ferentia if she's going to use the medicine as an antidote. As Estira is staring at her, Ferentia realizes that Estira is genuinely worried for her. She also starts to think about how Estira is kind-hearted. Not only is she skilled, but she's also delicate, gentle, and faithful as well. Firentia then grins and replies, I told you this isn't for me. Firentia also apologizes and adds that she can't tell her everything. She further starts to think about how this is why she wants Estira. Not just because of what she'll accomplish in the future, but because she's both good and reliable. Firentia then clenches her hands and says, but just as you might have guessed, I am going to be taking this with me to the palace soon. She adds that in the palace, she can trust her. She promises Estira and reassures her that this medicine will be delivered to someone who desperately needs it. Upon hearing these statements, Estira tells her that this isn't what she's worried about. She adds that she's simply worried that such a young lady is trying to do something too serious. Upon hearing this response, Ferentia starts to giggle and is happy that she's worried for her. She further reassures Estira that she means it and how she'll be very careful. She also asks Estira that since she's promised to support her dream, shouldn't she work hard to keep it? As Estira is responding to her question, Ferentia interrupts her and states to her to not be nervous. She adds that she will tell her everything once the time comes. She made this medicine, so she deserves to know. She further signals Estira to keep this a secret until then. Estira is silent at first, but then agrees to not tell anyone. We then switch to the next scene where Ferentia and her father are walking to their carriage. As they are walking, Ferentia starts to think about how it's a lie if she said that what she's trying to do isn't dangerous at all, but it's also true that there won't be much to worry about. Ferentia is aware that she's just an eight-year-old child right now, and if she were to be found somewhere inside the palace where she's not supposed to be, then no one will suspect her, as they'll simply think that she's lost. Ferentia's father then calls out to her. As he's trembling in fear, her father turns pale and says, It won't be that grave, so don't be nervous. You remember what your grandfather told you, right? Just think of it as having a nice meal. And my dear Tia, your daddy will protect you from whatever happens, okay? Upon hearing this, Ferentia starts to wonder what her father is going to do about his faint-heartedness and timidity. She then reassures her father that she's all right. As she's trying to make her father feel more comfortable, she starts to think about how there are definitely many restrictions to being a child, but she'll make good use of the aspects that can be used to her advantage. Suddenly, the carriage comes to an abrupt stop. Ferentia's father questions the coachman about what's wrong. The coachman explains that the Imperial Palace guards have stopped them. The Imperial guards then mention to Ferentia's father that he must undergo inspection for palace security. They also request him to get off the carriage. Upon hearing this question, Ferentia starts to clench her bag and is surprised that the Imperial guards are inspecting the Lombardi carriage. She is also aware that the milk and medicine that is in her bag has limited usage. So if she gets caught then they're definitely going to get suspicious. She further starts to wonder what she should do now. Ferentia's father then gets out of the carriage and introduces himself to the Imperial Guards. He adds that he was invited by the Imperial family. He further says, the pact between the Lombardus and the Dorellis should still be respected, yet has such an event happened before? Upon hearing this question, the Imperial Guard bows and apologizes to him. He also asks Ferentia's father to cooperate. Meanwhile, Ferentia is looking at her father through the carriage window and starts to think about how, in principle, all carriages emblazoned with the Lombardi crest are allowed entry into the emperor's office without hindrance. She is also worried because despite that, the imperial guards are still insisting on carrying on the search within the palace. Ferentia's father then questions the imperial guards if this is an order from the empress. However, the guards don't answer this question and instead just apologize to him. Upon Ferentia seeing this, she believes that the Empress is stalling. She's also aware that if she gets caught with such a heavily saturated milk and medicine, then she's bound to be interrogated about its use. As Ferentia is clenching onto her bag, she starts to wonder what she should do and knows that she needs to hide it somehow. Suddenly, Ferentia has an idea on how to accomplish this. Meanwhile, Ferentia's father states to the guards that he shall consent to the search, 
However, they must not touch Ferentia. Likewise, he won't allow them to lay a single finger on his body. He adds that it shouldn't be unreasonable for him to say this in the Lombardi name, and unless they wish to lose their positions by carrying out a poorly thought-out search, they ought to behave with propriety. The guards glance at each other and then agree to his request. Once they are done the search, they tell Ferentia's father that there seems to be nothing suspicious, so they will now end the inspection. They add that he may return to his carriage. Upon hearing this statement, Ferentia's father turns back around to get into the carriage and mentions to Ferentia that they should depart. He adds that she must have been very scared. However, once Ferentia's father is completely turned around and looks at the carriage, he realizes that Ferentia isn't there anymore. We then see the next scene where Ferentia is inside the forest and is searching for something. As she's walking through the forest, she starts thinking about how this is strange as she's sure that she definitely noticed something that was a bit far away. She is aware that there's no way that there are two dark-haired children in a palace like this. She also takes a quick peek at the Lombardi carriage behind her and realizes that she's now far away from it. She then apologizes to her dad and further starts to think about how she left thoughtlessly, but she can't let an opportunity like this slip away. We then learn that in Ferentia's past life, after Perez became the crown prince, she watched him mercilessly take down the Lombardi family. But she managed to get a piece of information about him from the guild by using all the money she had. The piece of information that she got about him was that the empress locked him and his mother up in a closed-off palace located in the forest west of where the empress's palace stood, where she could watch over them. The empress erased their existence by confining them like this. And once Perez's mother had passed, the empress began to gradually poison the young prince. Although she used a small amount that wouldn't kill him right away, the poison worked steadily and meticulously. Though the second prince survived, he developed a severe case of insomnia as an after-effect. However, in the end, this was a piece of useless information for Ferentia at the time. However, Ferentia knows that this information will be of great use to her now. She is also aware that in order to that, she needs to find him as soon as possible and hand him the Melkin medicine. Suddenly, Ferentia starts to hear some noises behind the bushes. She decides to take a peek to see what's causing the noise, and realizes that she doesn't have to look for him anymore as the second prince, Perez, is right in front of her. She further starts to wonder what he's doing over there right now. She believes that judging by his movements, it seems that he's eating something. All of a sudden, Ferentia steps on a tree branch, which alerts Perez. Upon noticing that he's been alerted, Ferentia tells him to calm down and reassures him that she's not here to harm him. She further asks him what he's eating right now. Perez doesn't reply to Ferentia and instead continues to eat the plant. Upon seeing this, Ferentia grabs his hand and shouts, Stop it! She also questions him about what the hell is he doing and just why is he eating grass. Perez replies, Because my stomach hurts. As Ferentia lets go of his hand, he explains that his stomach started hurting since a while ago. And he's read a book that said that eating this leaf will make him feel better. Upon hearing this explanation, Ferentia realizes that this is how he survived. She also realizes that in a world without his mother to embrace him, and in a palace where his father has forgotten about his existence, he's been depending on an unreliable source to find and eat herbs that could help him. All by himself. Ferentia then clenches her hand and says, Don't, don't eat stuff like that anymore. Because I have medicine for that. As she's rustling through her bag for the medicine, Perez asks her who she is and to give him more clarification. As Ferentia is giving him the medicine, she introduces herself to Perez. Perez also introduces himself and questions her about why is she crying. As Ferentia is wiping away her tears, she replies, Did, don't misunderstand. This is just because, well... Upon hearing this response, Perez asks her if she pities him. Ferentia states to him that she doesn't, and how it's not like that. However, Perez tells her that it's okay. He adds that his mom, the nanny, and everyone else was like that too. They said that he was to be pitied. He further mentions to Ferentia that, of course, two of them aren't around anymore. Upon hearing this statement, Ferentia starts to wonder why such a young child has to listen to all of that. 
She further calls him a bastard and wonders why he's saying all this, as if it's not a big deal. Ferentia then questions him about why he doesn't even have a nanny. Perez responds, she was dismissed a while ago. He adds that she didn't want to leave, but the soldiers dragged her away. Upon hearing this response, Ferentia starts to think about how the Empress is cruel. We then learn that in Ferentia's previous life, when she heard that the Empress had been locked up in a secluded palace, was forbidden to call a doctor, and died slowly, she thought that the second prince was cruel. However, now she wonders if he was taking revenge for the pain he had to endure under her watch. Perez then hands back the medicine to Ferentia and says, You shouldn't help me either. He further adds that he's giving the medicine back to her because she might die as well. Ferentia responded to Perez, expressing her reluctance to die. Perez then retorted, questioning if she hadn't already died, given their location in the Empress's palace. Ferentia retorted that Perez seemed to be aware of that fact as well. She then inquired about who made him unwell. Perez answered that anyone who associated with him ended up injured, dead, or abandoning him. Hearing this, Ferentia suggested that she need not concern herself with him and could just leave. In response, Ferentia was taken aback and remarked that Perez was truly an idiot if he held such beliefs. She further asserted that he should have reached out for help and asked others to save his life instead of thinking in that manner. Ferentia contemplated that it appeared as though Perez might find it difficult to act differently due to people always leaving him. She thought that ultimately the outcome would remain the same. With a sense of melancholy, she conveyed to Perez that he needn't worry about her since she was untouchable. Curious, Perez asked her for the reason behind this assurance. Ferentia responded, explaining that her safety was guaranteed because of her grandfather's formidable strength and his commitment to protecting her. Perez responded with appreciation, remarking that it was a reassuring thought. Ferentia then offered her assistance to Perez. Retrieving a bottle of candy, she instructed him to take it and tossed it in his direction. She added that she was short on time and instructed him about two tasks he needed to undertake in his life. The first involved taking the medicine twice daily, measuring half a spoon each time. The second task is for him to feign illness when someone observes him. Ferentia additionally noted that Perez had been consuming grass due to severe stomach pain, implying that he might be fed subpar food. She warned that if he were to suddenly recover, that individual might harm him using various methods. Observing Perez, she pondered that he didn't appear particularly engaged in listening to her. Taking a deep breath, Ferentia commented that it was challenging to place trust in someone encountered for the first time. In response, Perez stated that he trusted her because she had offered to assist him, becoming the first person besides his nanny to extend such help. He acknowledged the limited options he had and mentioned that even if she were to give him poison, it wouldn't alter much. Ferentia then responded, clarifying that it was merely medicine, as she had previously mentioned. Ferentia contemplated that being compared to an empress felt like utter nonsense. Perez's thoughts took a different direction, and he inquired whether he should continue living. Ferentia asked him to clarify what he meant. In response, Perez recounted that before her death, his mother had cared for him, urging him to live on no matter what. This, he explained, was the reason he resorted to eating grass. However, prior to that, he had experienced deteriorating health and had felt like everyone wished for his demise, which was a difficult reality to bear. Seeking Ferentia's perspective, he asked whether she believed he had a chance at a longer life and if it was worthwhile for him to continue living. Ferentia, taken aback and overwhelmed by his words, found herself at a loss for a response, feeling a sense of shame. Eventually, she mustered an apology, to which Perez questioned the reason for her apology. Perez responded, questioning the reason for Ferentia's tears and offered some candy to her. Ferentia reassured him that everything was fine and that the candies were meant for him. As she wiped away her tears, she realized they continued to flow. In the background, certain individuals in the forest were searching for Ferentia. When they noticed the pair, Ferentia communicated to Perez that it was time to depart and that she would remain hidden for a while. She advised him to remember her instructions. Curious, Perez inquired if she was leaving. 
In her thoughts, Firentia likened Perez's demeanor to that of a puppy. Gently placing her hand on his head, she instructed him to take care, adhere to his medication schedule, and play on the branches when no one was watching. She promised to bring a book for him when they met again. Perez asked about the possibility of another meeting. Firentia affirmed that they would indeed reunite, and they clasped their fingers in agreement. As Ferentia prepared to depart, she expressed her intention to return as soon as possible. Perez concurred, resolving to wait for her. With that, Ferentia left, leaving Perez behind. With a final declaration, she began to leave in earnest. Perez agreed with a determined mindset, thinking to himself that he would patiently await her return. And so, Ferentia departed, leaving Perez behind as she went on her way. The scene is set in Ferentia's bedroom, where she lies down after a meal, expressing that the day has been challenging. She begins to feel a discomfort in her stomach, and assumes that the food might not have settled well. The narrative then shifts to a past scene, portraying Ferentia's father embracing her and inquiring about her whereabouts. Ferentia responds, sharing that she had gone to capture adorable squirrels and managed to resolve the situation. The setting changes to a dining table, where the king remarks that both the Angeneses and Lombardies are vital pillars of the empire, suggesting that they should unite their strengths. Ferentia reflects on her own feelings, acknowledging her reluctance to be present at that moment. She also admits that she doesn't recall what she ate during that occasion. Despite her uncertainties, she acknowledges the complexity of portraying the Angeneses as equals to the Lombardis. The scene shifts back to the present with Ferentia still experiencing discomfort and realizing that she hasn't fully recovered. She reflects on a recent memory, noting her surprise at her father's timidity and his unexpected assertiveness towards the emperor and empress. Her father addresses the group, explaining that the empress's knights halted a carriage bearing the Lombardi crest and proceeded to conduct identity checks on him and his daughter. Ferentia is taken aback by the situation. Her father then directs a question to the king, inquiring if this occurrence is a misunderstanding. Ferentia observes the expressions of both the king and the queen, realizing that their surprise is likely due to her father's unusual behavior, which contrasts his usual timid nature. Despite her expectations, the king's response is not entirely satisfactory. He then turns to the queen, stating that the knight's loyalty remains unwavering, especially when it involves the transgression of his longtime friend. The queen offers her perspective, suggesting that the knights in question could be newcomers to the palace. This explanation clarifies that their rigorous checking was not a careless action. Ferentia contemplates that the king might be using the Angeneses to keep tabs on the Lombardies. Given this context, she finds it unsurprising that he would defend such actions. Then the queen directs her words to Galahan, expressing the need for leniency towards the souls of those knights and urging forgiveness. Ferentia speculates that the queen might be harboring resentment towards the Lombardus. As she lies down on her bed, Ferentia contemplates that the Angeneses have consistently been a troublesome constraint. She envisions a scenario where, in the absence of a second prince, the Angeneses would need to rely on the Lombardies for their own benefit only to discard them when convenient. Despite the complexities, Ferentia anticipates positive outcomes. The queen added that she had been fortunate to locate the second prince and provide him with medicine. This had spared her the inconvenience of frequent visits to the imperial palace. Reflecting on her memories from her previous life, she recognized their value as a guide for her new life's composition. However, she acknowledged that this shouldn't lead her to presume she knows everyone's stories or the unfolding events from that point onward. Many aspects had altered compared to the last time. For instance, her father had gained prominence, whereas he was previously overlooked, and his relationship with the queen had turned strained. The second prince no longer suffered from poison and had progressively improved in health. Despite these alterations, Ferentia didn't believe that these changes alone would reshape the future. Contemplating Perez, she wished for him to have a restful night and bade him good night before settling in for sleep. The scene transitions to Perez, who is asleep in a dim, aged room. He gazes at the pouch containing the medicines and the candies, 
recalling Ferentia's instructions. She had advised him to undertake two tasks, the first being to take the medicine twice daily, half a spoon at each instance. Perez follows her advice and ingests the medicine, experiencing a sharp cough as a result. He then examines one of the candies, reflecting on Ferentia's mention of using them to counteract bitterness. Trying one, he discovers its sweetness and ponders her words once more. She had spoken about her grandfather's protective influence and her commitment to assisting him. He realizes that she wants him to live longer, and he finds himself growing confident in the belief that he indeed has a future ahead. The following morning, Firentia awakens and, while eating her meal, contemplates the necessity of comprehending the things she assumed she knew more diligently. Her brother chides her for eating hastily, to which she responds that, starting from that day, the term later would no longer have a place in her vocabulary. Her brother presents her with a blue ribbon, prompting her to explain that she believes in preparing for tasks in advance to expedite their completion. She considers the ribbon a prime example of this proactive approach. Ferentia approaches Estira and calls her over. Estira questions why Ferentia has come to see her. Ferentia explains that she has come to request a recommendation letter. Estira has only one month left to submit her application for admission, and she is Dr. O'Malley's most accomplished pupil. Her proficiency in preparing medicine is outstanding, and the doctor has highly praised her dedication and thoroughness. Ferentia is confident that if Estira wishes for it, the doctor will readily provide a letter for her. Subsequently, Ferentia and Estira proceed to see the doctor. He inquires if they are referring to the letter of recommendation from that year. The doctor expresses concern because he has already given that particular letter to someone else. Both Ferentia and Estira are taken aback by the doctor's revelation. Ferentia inquires about the student to whom he had given the letter. The doctor explains that it was a student he had taught years ago. Once outside the room, Ferentia apologizes to Estira for the unexpected turn of events and assures her that she will obtain a recommendation letter for her from another source. Ferentia reflects that she had failed to anticipate this situation. She realizes that Dr. O'Malley is the Lombardus family's personal doctor and holds considerable influence, effectively serving as a guaranteed ticket to admission. She understands that people wouldn't oppose his decision. Ferentia blames herself for not being diligent enough to foresee this, given the comparative ease of her new life. She acknowledges that she would have been in significant trouble if she hadn't taken action after the lessons she learned the previous day. Ferentia expressed to Estira her determination to find a solution for her situation as quickly as possible. Estira reassured her, stating that she was fine. Ferentia questioned what Estira meant by that. Estira elaborated, explaining that she had learned about a research opportunity that could offer greater skills and knowledge compared to a standard course. She pointed out that being a young pupil under a doctor's guidance was beneficial, and she admitted to lacking extensive knowledge. Estira also mentioned that the doctor had already given a recommendation letter to someone else for this year. Ferentia pondered why Estira was being so critical of herself. She might have been more inclined to believe her if Estira had communicated all this with a sad expression. However, Estira looked at Ferentia and expressed her gratitude for Ferentia's efforts, assuring her that she would exert herself to acquire skills and attempt again next year. Ferentia took hold of Estira's hands and urged her to wait and listen to what she had to say. She firmly stated that regardless of the circumstances, she was determined to ensure Estira's admission to the academy that year. Ferentia settled into a chair and Estira asked if she had managed to calm down. Ferentia confirmed her composure and also extended an apology to Estira. Estira shared her perspective, mentioning that while it was commendable that Ferentia had taken action, it was unwise to raise one's voice in front of the doctor as it might create trouble for him. He had overreacted due to not having foreseen that particular piece of information. She acknowledged that she sometimes took things for granted and didn't treat certain matters seriously enough, relying on her knowledge of future events. Estira offered her a cup of tea, which Ferentia accepted. As Estira served the tea, she explained that she only had herbal tea as a refreshment option. Ferentia thanked her for the tea and began to drink it. 
Then Estira asked her that what she was trying to tell her earlier, it was to console her. And she is not fine, and she didn't expect it that. Of course, she'd be lying if she were to say that she wasn't anticipating it, though. Ferentia replied that it is not true. Then Estira pardoned her. Then Ferentia said that she told that she will bring a recommendation letter for her, so why she have to console Estira? Then she said that she want to ask this, that why Estira always said that she didn't have so much skills. Then Estira replied that it's all because she is young, as she already told her. Ferentia replied that besides that young age, Estira was under the doctor who was the family doctor of Lombardis. So she have to consider her as a prodigy and have more confidence, Ferentia remarked that she was well informed about the situation because she had visited the place frequently and observed it closely. She also noted that Dr. O'Malley often utilized medicines crafted by Estira. Ferentia highlighted that almost all of the medicines Estira had developed were not only effective, but were also used by the doctor himself. Ferentia recalled an instance when the doctor had mentioned that a particular medicine was valuable and they intended to take it to the medical center. This revelation had startled Estira, and Ferentia had been present during that interaction. Ferentia held a strong belief in Estira's ability to create effective medicines. Estira, however, downplayed her achievements, stating that anyone else with the same knowledge could replicate her work. Ferentia countered by explaining that while she might not be knowledgeable in medicine, she understood the basic principles of how medicines were created. She emphasized that the exact proportions of ingredients could greatly affect a medicine's effectiveness. Ferentia believed that Estira's skill and expertise played a significant role in her medicine's success, but Estira continued to maintain her modesty, stating that she knew where she stood. Ferentia felt a sense of sadness, Comprehending Estira's position as a commoner and a young individual who likely faced harsh criticisms from others. She recognized how hurtful words could impact Estira's self-esteem. Ferentia understood that Estira's efforts and talents were often attributed to luck, and aspiring for more recognition was sometimes seen as greed. She realized that this situation mirrored her own experiences from her previous life, where individuals might often shrink away from acknowledging their worth and feel undeserving of success, even when they worked hard to achieve it. Continuing her thoughts, Ferentia realized she might be delving too deeply into the matter. She acknowledged that in her previous life, Estira had managed to secure admission to the Academy without any assistance from Ferentia. In the end, Estira had achieved something that was undeniable. Ferentia recognized that Estira might not fully believe her due to Ferentia's age and expertise, but she insisted that Estira needed to grasp this perspective. Ferentia told Estira that she was considering providing a recommendation letter. She emphasized that it was wasteful to be held back by others' opinions. Ferentia declared her intention to obtain a recommendation letter from her grandfather. Estira was taken aback and expressed her surprise mentioning that she hadn't expected to hear this from Ferentia. Ferentia explained that the head of the Lombardis family would present a letter to someone deserving, and Estira needed to prove her own worth to earn their trust. Estira found the idea overwhelming, wondering how she could achieve it. Ferentia assured her that she wasn't pressuring her and that she believed Estira was capable. She mentioned that even if Estira were to fail, the delay would be by only a year in terms of admission preparation. Ferentia encouraged Estira to give it a try and reminded her of her own confidence. The scene shifted to Ferentia's grandfather's office. Rochelle informed the grandfather that he would proceed with the list of books. The grandfather entrusted the task to him. Rochelle also shared his belief regarding the location of the new library. Just then, Ferentia entered the room and greeted both of them. She thought it was fortunate that both were present as she intended to discuss something with them. She exchanged greetings with Brochelle, and he mentioned that he was concerned the Duke, grandfather, was busy with work. The grandfather inquired about Ferentia's reason for visiting and asked if she wanted to spend time with him. Ferentia clarified that she hadn't come to pact, play, but rather because she needed something. This caught Brochel off guard, and Ferentia proceeded to address her grandfather, affirming that her visit wasn't about any urgent matter. She then questioned if this was true. 
Rochel internally marveled at how Ferentia dared to disturb the head of the Lombardus family and was surprised by her audacity. Ferentia stated her request. She wanted a recommendation letter from her grandfather for the Academy. Her grandfather's expression froze, and Brochel couldn't help but speculate that Ferentia might have picked up some misguided idea from somewhere. He responded, cautioning that a letter of recommendation from the family patriarch wasn't something to be given on a whim. Ferentia glanced at Brochel and then addressed her grandfather again, adding that she also needed another recommendation letter, this time for Brochel. This took Brochel by surprise, and he offered an apologetic response to Ferentia's unexpected request. As Ferentia continued eating, her grandfather clarified that he was discussing the matter concerning Dr. O'Malley's pupil. Brochel wondered why he was present during this discussion and having tea at the same time. Ferentia acknowledged her grandfather's point and emphasized that Estira had a remarkable ability to create highly effective medicines. Brochel responded, implying that Astira indeed possessed skill in medicines, as Ferentia had stated. Ferentia agreed, pointing out that Dr. O'Malley used all the medicines Astira made. She recounted an instance when Brochel had gotten a paper cut not long ago and had used a new ointment from the doctor. Brochel shared that the new ointment was more fragrant and less sticky compared to the previous one. Ferentia highlighted that all the medicines were crafted by the young lady Estira, and not Dr. O'Malley. Brochel pointed out that there was a difference between studying herbs and medicines and effectively using that knowledge to create medicine. Turning to her grandfather, Brochel mentioned that if what Ferentia was saying was true, it would be advantageous for Estira to develop her skills at the academy as soon as possible. Her grandfather responded, recalling the incident involving the talented sculptor from the past. He noted that Ferentia was associated with several gifted individuals. He turned to Ferentia, explaining that providing a recommendation letter to Estira was equivalent to lending her his name. He expressed his intention to support Estira in obtaining a scholarship, but he expressed concerns about risking the reputation of the Lombardi name. With a hint of sadness, Ferentia commented that the request seemed to be asking too much. Her grandfather tried to console Ferentia, telling her not to be disappointed and assuring her that with Brochel's recommendation letter, Estira's admission would be a straightforward process. Ferentia expressed her determination to prove herself. Her grandfather asked what she meant, and Brochel interjected, understanding that Ferentia found it hard to believe his praise of Estira's skill. To demonstrate Estira's medicine's excellence, Brochel proposed that Ferentia judge it firsthand. As Ferentia sat in her room, she contemplated the situation. She recognized that her words might have come across as arrogant, but both her grandfather and Brochel had their own perspectives and experiences. In order to satisfy them both and secure their recommendation letters, she needed to select a medicine with common efficacy that could impress them both. She realized the challenge of finding a medicine that would meet their expectations. She acknowledged her recklessness, but understood that a recommendation letter from someone of medical expertise like Dr. O'Malley might not be necessary, especially if the letter's focus wasn't on academic achievements. She pondered potential solutions and then reflected on what her father was doing beside her. The weight of her father's sigh seemed to suffocate her thoughts. Ferentia directed her attention to her father and remarked that she was correct. Answers weren't likely to emerge immediately from her current contemplation. She decided that assisting her father might help her calm down, so she asked him why he had been sighing so much and if there was something troubling him. Galahan hugged her and assured her that it was nothing, just that he had been lost in thought. Ferentia responded by advising him to talk to someone if he did have a problem. Galahan acknowledged that he might have caused his daughter to worry, but insisted that there was genuinely nothing to worry about. Their eye contact lingered for a moment, and he explained that he had been pondering something and hesitating because it was a task he had no prior experience with. Ferentia inquired if this task was different from working with soft fabric, displaying her curiosity. Galahan proceeded to share the details with her, acknowledging the complexity of it. Ferentia exclaimed that it was quite challenging, and Galahan agreed musing on how a child like her could understand such matters. Ferentia marveled at her father's ingenuity, 
wondering if he was a genius to come up with such ideas in their contemporary era. She realized that if this business venture succeeded, it could significantly change the Empire's wealth. Gallahan appreciated her listening and remarked that her support gave him strength. Ferentia laughed inwardly, thinking that if she were to tell him the truth about her abilities, he probably wouldn't believe her. Ferentia considered that her father needed an adult figure to provide him with support and advice in his business endeavors. She suggested asking Sir Pellet for assistance. Gallahan agreed, thinking that it might be a good idea. Ferentia affirmed that Sir Pellet had always been helpful in answering her questions, especially when it came to matters of commerce. She believed that Sir Pellet's insights were reliable and up-to-date regarding the Coroy flannel business. Gallahan was open to the suggestion, and Ferentia noted that Sir Pellet appreciated organized thoughts, so putting their ideas down in writing might be more effective. She reflected that greatness wasn't always required for something to be amazing. Often, common discomforts could lead to innovative solutions and high demand. She recognized that both Brauchel and her grandfather were older, and likely had ample opportunities to sit and think. As Ferentia stood up, Gallahan asked where she was headed. She mentioned meeting a friend and assured him she'd be back before dinner. As she left, Ferentia pondered whether Astira would manage to complete her task on time. Despite her concerns, she remained optimistic, believing it wouldn't be too challenging. Upon arriving at Astira's house, Ferentia embraced her friend, thinking that if their plan unfolded as hoped, both Astira's and her own wishes could come true. The scene transitions to Astira's lab, where she's conducting an experiment. She confirms that the viscosity is satisfactory and turns off the heat before adding springia powder dried with a fusing agent. Just then, Dr. O'Malley knocks on the door and enters, questioning her about the various scents in the air. He identifies the ingredients she's been using and notices the red powder, wondering what she's working on. He inquires if she's making something and calls her experiment more than just a small one. Estira avoids making eye contact as she responds. The doctor remarks that if it's a small experiment, he could simply order her to stop. Estira apologizes, and Dr. O'Malley mentions that he's heard about Ferentia pressuring her, implying that she's been acting recklessly. Estira refutes this, insisting that Ferentia was only trying to help. The doctor, asserting his role as Astira's master, questions what kind of master would let their disciples stray from the right path. He places his hand on Astira's shoulder and apologizes for misunderstanding her desire to join the academy. He explains that his intentions were for her benefit, as she still has a long way to go before becoming a true researcher. He emphasizes that he can't bear to watch her humiliate herself and advises her not to be overly ambitious, but to faithfully learn under his guidance. He promises that he will give her a recommendation letter himself, either next year or the year after that. The doctor mentions a recent encounter with Dohile, the Flan Guild leader, who expressed gratitude for the recommendation letter given to his son. The doctor recalls Dokchile's appreciation for the medical ingredients he provides, Dokchile also mentions rumors he's heard about a commoner child under the doctor's tutelage receiving a recommendation letter from the Lombardi family. Dr. O'Malley chuckles and mentions that Estira's age plays a role in the situation. He expresses his hope that she doesn't humiliate herself or cause trouble for the Lombardi family due to her ambitions. Dochile adds that despite having a mentor like Dr. O'Malley, Estira doesn't seem to realize the embarrassment she's creating. He presents a ring box and implies that some people don't understand their place, indicating that the ring is a token of gratitude. Dr. O'Malley questions the gift, and Dochile explains that it's a small gesture of thanks. Dochile brings up the issue of Estira's behavior and mentions that her actions could damage not only Dr. O'Malley's reputation, but also that of the Academy. He urges the doctor to talk some sense into her, the scene then returns to Dr. O'Malley and Astira, where he acknowledges that she's not foolish and understands his perspective. He reveals that the child Dochile referred to is Dochile's own, implying that Astira should consider the implications of her actions. Dr. O'Malley assures Astira that he will find a different reason to refuse writing her a letter of recommendation next year. 
Estira acknowledges her understanding, and the doctor reassures her that it's all right. Estira vows to do her best moving forward. Then Doctor become anger and shout on her and said that why she is doing even after he told everything to her. Then Estira requested to him because she want to meet the expectations of Ferentia. Then Estira reminds all the words of Ferentia that she will help her to achieve her dream, and it's all her skills and medicines, so why is she keep insisting that it's nothing at all? And also Ferentia brings a recommendation letter from her grandfather. So Estira, didn't she want to find out how far she can get? Estira thinks that her dream that even she thought was a pipe dream. And besides of laughing at her, Ferentia cheers her to get it. Then Estira said to Doctor that she will make sure it doesn't affect her work. However, if this fails, then she will admit her foolishness and follow Doctor's wish. That's why just this once she want to follow Ferentia's confidence in her. Then, by anger, Doctor said that if she didn't listen him, then he will never give a recommendation letter to her. Then, Estira apologized to him. And Doctor said that Estira is disobeying him till end. Then Doctor shout on her and said that he didn't need an ungrateful pupil, and do as she wished to do, and Doctor gone from there. Then whole body of Estira is shaking, and she thinks that did she make an irreversible mistake. But it's fine if they say that she is fool and she now also believe in herself at least once. Both Ferentia and Estira sit on chairs, observing the medicine Estira has prepared. Estira expresses her intention to open the container, and upon doing so, she notices the pleasant scent of the medicine. Estira mentions that she paid special attention to the formula. As Estira applies the ointment to her hand, Ferentia feels a cooling sensation on the area. Ferentia reflects on her two main requirements for the medicine. It should soothe swelling and infections, and it should have an herbal formula with a cooling effect. Ferentia suggests increasing the concentration of the stronger drug in order to enhance its quick and powerful action. Estira introduces the herb known as Hypsi, a vital component in the formulation. It is a key element in the creation of peppermint. Ferentia recognizes the ointment as Teb Tiggy Balm, similar to a miracle medicine once used in Korea. Ferentia takes the ointment and ponders about identifying her grandfather's sore leg. Estira calls her attention, reminding her of the effort and determination it took to create the balm. Estira reveals that she applied the balm to her arm for a few days, and it didn't cause any side effects like a rash. Moreover, the pain in her wrist decreased and her skin seemed to improve. Ferentia contemplates the potential of adapting the formula by removing Hypsi to serve other purposes. Estira wonders if Ferentia's grandfather, the Duke and Brochel, will be satisfied with this kind of ointment. Ferentia asks Estira if there's anything else she would like in addition to the recommendation letter. Estira contemplates the question, and Ferentia playfully suggests that the medicine they've created is worth more than two recommendation letters. Ferentia begins to leave the room, but Estira interjects, insisting that the medicine is worth more. Ferentia advises Estira to take her time to consider her desires and aspirations. Exiting the room, Ferentia opens the door to the outside and muses that her life is about to change significantly. With a determined look, she steps outside and reflects on how Estira's ointment has gained immense popularity. Back in the room, Estira becomes emotional and tearfully expresses her gratitude, wondering how she can repay Ferentia for all her help. Ferentia chuckles and dismisses the idea of repayment, emphasizing that it's Estira's skills that have brought success. Ferentia recalls a few days earlier when Brochel mentioned his finger pain that used to wake him at night, and the Duke spoke about his persistent knee pain. Both Brochel and the Duke are shocked by this revelation and eagerly question Ferentia about the details. Ferentia feels delighted that both Brochel and the Duke appreciate the ointment. She realizes that if they like it, others might as well. Lombardus Guild decides to produce a limited amount of Estira's ointment due to the difficulty of obtaining some ingredients. They plan to send it as a gift to high-ranking aristocrats and sell a less potent version to the public. Estira is entitled to a portion of the proceeds because she created the ointment. The scene returns to Ferentia and Estira. Estira acknowledges that Ferentia's belief in her was the reason she got this opportunity. 
she promises to work hard in academics and not disappoint Ferentia. Ferentia expresses her trust in Astira and then asks for a favor. Astira eagerly asks what it is. Ferentia explains the illness known as Trenbro, which leads to the loss of sensation in the extremities and gradual muscle stiffness, ultimately causing respiratory failure and death. She mentions the medicinal herb called Rosen, which is found in the area near the academy. Ferentia hopes that Astira can discover a cure for Trenbro using that ingredient. They hold each other's hands, and Astira expresses surprise at Ferentia's knowledge of the required ingredient. They share a meaningful look, and Astira agrees to do her best, although she can't guarantee the outcome. The scene transitions to Grandpa Duke's location. Brochel greets the grandfather of Ferentia and remarks that he seems to be in an excellent mood. Grandfather smiles and asks if his mood was that obvious. He retrieves a book from an Almira, cupboard or cabinet, and inquires about Brochel's opinion on Ferentia. Brochel expresses his admiration for Ferentia's intelligence and cleverness, stating that he is truly impressed by her abilities. Grandfather agrees, sharing his own similar thoughts about Ferentia. He reflects on her and ponders if other people will also appreciate the ointment that Astira has created. He mentions that Astira will need two letters of recommendation and a scholarship, and he asks Brochel to provide her with the proceeds from the ointment's sale, as they made a deal with the old Lulac. Grandfather notes that the proposed dividend ratio was reasonably sound and marvels at the site after all these years. Rochelle concurs with Grandfather's sentiments, expressing gratitude to Ferentia. He believes that Ferentia's actions are contributing to a brighter future for the Lombardi family. Grandfather agrees with Brochel's assessment, acknowledging that the future of the Lombardi family indeed looks promising. The scene shifts to a room where Gallahan and Grandfather's assistant are seated across from each other. The assistant holds a letter in his hand. Gallahan is feeling nervous and wonders if something might be wrong with his business plan. He worries that perhaps the plan he proposed is not up to par. The assistant places the letter on the table and comments that it's brilliant. Gallahan is taken aback and asks if the plan is truly brilliant, seeking clarification. The assistant reaffirms that it is indeed brilliant. Gallahan, still nervous, responds with a hesitant, Wait, what is it? The assistant continues, mentioning that they've heard about the Durak Guildmaster visiting Gallahan frequently. He inquires if this project will involve collaborating with him. Gallahan quickly assures the assistant that this is purely his own business endeavor and that he plans to carry it out independently. The assistant then asks if Gallahan has discussed or shared information about this business with the Diorak Guildmaster or anyone else from his family. Gallahan reflects that he might have mentioned it to Ferentia, but she was just a child. He replies to the assistant that the assistant is the first person to know about this business plan. He also mentions that the Durak Guildmaster did express interest in hearing about the plan when he visited the palace. Gallahan explains that he's been refining the plans since that visit. The assistant probes further, asking if anything specific happened at the palace. Gallahan responds that there wasn't anything serious. He had simply noticed that the Empress didn't seem particularly fond of him. Gallahan's inner thoughts reveal that he suspects there might be a connection between the Diorak Guildmaster, the Angenesis, and the Empress. He concludes that it's likely the Empress who wants to know about his business, and she might be the driving force behind the inquiries. The assistant reflects on Gallahan Lombardi, the third son of the family, who had previously been perceived as someone who immersed himself in books and avoided family disputes. Despite the rumors that he was out of touch with the real world, he had developed a bold business plan on his own, leaving the assistant quite surprised. The assistant acknowledges that he himself will gladly offer assistance. Gallahan inquires about the assistant's intentions, prompting the assistant to reveal his condition. He expresses admiration for Gallahan's brilliant plan and jokes about the timing of his compliments. He suggests that if he were to witness the success of the business from the sidelines, he would likely feel envious. Therefore, he proposes becoming Gallahan's partner in the endeavor. Part Gallahan is taken aback and asks the assistant to pardon him for his surprise. The assistant straightforwardly explains that if Gallahan agrees to his terms, he would be honored to provide advice and support as his partner.
Galahan hesitates and mentions that while partnering with Sir Clevivan would indeed be an honor, he plans to keep the business under his personal assets and name, rather than the Lombardi name. The assistant responds by reiterating that the business plan itself already holds great potential, regardless of the name associated with it. He is offering his partnership based on the strength of the plan and Galahan's abilities. Galahan inquires if the assistant needed additional funds for the venture. He offers to provide assistance from his personal funds if needed. The assistant initially hesitates, but then assures Galahan that it's not necessary, and he has enough resources for the partnership. They shake hands, and Galahan mentions that the contract will be prepared promptly. The assistant agrees and expresses his pleasure in working together. As they part ways, Galahan asks if it was the Duke who suggested he seek advice from the assistant. The assistant is surprised by the question and inquires if Galahan came to him willingly or due to the Duke's suggestion. Galahan reveals that it was actually his daughter who encouraged him to seek advice from the assistant. He explains that upon hearing his concerns, she recommended him to consult the assistant, praising his knowledge. The assistant reflects that such advice might seem common coming from a child, but it's still valuable. The scene shifts to Lophiel, who recalls giving the assistant a carved log as a gift. The assistant gifted her an emerald brooch in return. The scene returns to the room where the assistant is standing, thinking about how the direction of the Koroi flannel business changed when Ferentia intervened. The scene shifts again to Ferentia, who believes that people are the most valuable asset to a merchant. She emphasizes that no matter how competent an individual is, they can't accomplish everything alone. The scene goes back to the room, where Galahan informs the assistant that he will be leaving. The assistant contemplates the situation and decides it's better to confirm things with his own eyes. The scene is set in a room where Ferentia and Lorraine are present. Lorraine is working on Ferentia's hair and compliments how good red color suits Ferentia. Ferentia thanks Lorraine and returns the compliment by saying that white looks great on Lorraine. Ferentia reflects on how Lorraine's appearance has transformed and how she now looks like a May Lily fairy. She enjoys Lorraine's company and beauty. However, Ferentia's attention shifts to Sir Clarivan, who has been looking at her strangely for the past ten days. She perceives his gaze as predatory, like that of a hawk eyeing its prey. She asks Lorraine to move away, and as they leave, Sir Clarivan approaches them and asks if they are leaving. Ferentia is taken aback by his question, and she realizes that her initial reaction might have been an overreaction. She questions why he is accompanying her, and he clarifies that he wants to meet Galahan and asks if she would like to come along. Ferentia agrees, understanding that he meant they should all go to her father's office together. As they reach the office, they find Galahan and Sir Clarivan chatting over tea. Ferentia can't quite catch the conversation, but gathers that it's related to the business plan. Clarivan explains the core of the business plan to Galahan, focusing on affordability and making the products accessible to common people. The location of the store in the Heslot market is chosen because commoners would be more willing to try new commodities different from what nobles consume. Galahan and Clarivan discuss how the affordability aspect is a crucial factor, and Ferentia begins to think that this business is taking an unusual direction. Clarivan listens to Galahan's input and responds by suggesting that the project should focus on appealing to those who desire high-quality goods. By targeting a wealthy minority, the business can generate a trickle-down effect and stimulate the interest of other commoners. Ferentia becomes bewildered by Clarivan's sudden change in approach and finds his idea somewhat nonsensical. Ferentia reflects on the existing clothing industry, where clothing is often made by hand or tailor-made for aristocrats. She understands that ready-to-wear clothing could be a revolutionary concept, making new garments accessible to a broader audience at a lower cost. This is the brilliance of her father's plan. Galahan further discusses the use of high-quality materials to enhance desire for the products, and Clarivan agrees, mentioning the need to consider interior design and order placement costs. Ferentia, feeling strongly about the matter, interjects. She questions whether they should allow someone else to buy the same item if they find it special. She emphasizes that her father's goal is to make clothes that are easily accessible and wearable for many people. Changing the plan would alter this goal significantly. 
Ferentia contemplates whether to take a firm stance on this matter. She realizes that if she simply sits back and observes, the business plan might deviate from her father's original intention. She suggests that once people are accustomed to buying and wearing regular clothing, they can introduce more beautiful and expensive options. She gazes at Clarivan, expressing her confusion and concerns about altering the direction of the plan. Ferentia becomes puzzled by Clarivan's unexpected smile and shift in behavior. She wonders what might have caused this change in him. As she walks, carrying a book and lost in her thoughts, a waitress greets her, adding to her sense of unease. The smile from Clarivan and his altered attitude seem suspicious to her. Entering the classroom, Ferentia notices that no one else is present, including the twins and Lorraine, who usually arrives early. Clarivan informs her that no one else will be coming that day. Ferentia looks at him, clearly intrigued and concerned about the situation. The mystery of the empty classroom and Clarivan's demeanor leaves her wondering what might be going on. Ferentia tells Clarivan that she has a goal she wants to achieve, and she needed to create a situation where everyone underestimates her. She believes that if she revealed her true abilities too soon, it would complicate things. Clarivan asks what that goal is, and Ferentia explains that she wants to make Astira's ointment widely known and for it to become a product that people use in their daily lives. She wants to support Astira and make her known as a talented individual. Clarivan questions why she's taking such a roundabout approach and why she didn't consult him, as he might have been able to help. Ferentia responds that she wanted to make things work without relying on the prestige of the Lombardi name or his assistance, as she was curious to see if she could succeed on her own. Clarivan then points out that she must be aware of how much he knows, but she must also be aware that he's been holding back from helping her. Ferentia acknowledges that she had a feeling he was keeping a close eye on her. Clarivan admits that he had the intention of remaining a spectator and watching her, and he wanted to see how far she could go on her own. Ferentia apologizes for causing confusion and asks if he's angry. Clarivan clarifies that he's not angry, but he wants to know what she'll do next. Ferentia expresses her determination to achieve her goals, and Clarivan tells her that he'll be watching her closely, hoping that she doesn't disappoint him. The two of them share a moment of understanding and determination, each aware of the other's intentions. Ferentia is ready to move forward with her plans, and Clarivan seems intrigued by her determination and willingness to go against expectations. Clarivan acknowledges her point, understanding that if Ferentia were to stand out too much at this stage, it could potentially attract unwanted attention and put her in a vulnerable position. Ferentia continues, saying that she's observing the situation and learning about the dynamics within the family and the aristocratic society. She wants to bide her time and build her reputation slowly and steadily. Ferentia expresses her concern that if she were to make a move too soon, her actions could be misinterpreted, and she might not be able to achieve her goal. She wants to prove herself based on her own efforts, not relying solely on her family's name or the assistance of others. She believes that the path she's chosen will allow her to gain the trust and respect of those around her in a genuine way. Clarivan agrees with her reasoning, admitting that he's curious to see how far she can go with her approach. He acknowledges that she has the potential to be quite formidable in the future. Ferentia thanks him for his understanding and assures him that she won't let his expectations down. Clarivan encourages her to do her best and keep moving forward. As they continue their conversation, it becomes clear that Ferentia and Clarivan have a complex and multifaceted relationship. While there is a mentor-student dynamic, there's also an element of mutual respect and understanding between them. Ferentia's determination and calculated approach have garnered Clarivan's attention and interest, and he seems eager to see how she navigates her way through the challenges ahead. Clarivan called her once again and thought that she had already considered that. Then, Ferentia told Clarivan that he remembered her answer for the second assignment during class. She had thought that the most valuable assets to a merchant were people. Then she moved her hand towards him and said that before understanding the rule, she had wanted trustworthy people around her. Clarivan replied that he could always price his worth. Ferentia replied that, however, she didn't want to be simply told that she had what it took. She wanted a position that no one could deny. 
If she was going to prove her worth, then she would like to prove herself so firmly that no one but she could be considered as the next head of the family. Then Clarivan thought for a moment and said, What if I were to take Vidio's side and reveal her plan? Ferentia replied that it was nonsense and assured him that something like that would never happen in the future. She also mentioned that after all, Clarivan loved Lombardus. Clarivan thought about how after the death of her grandfather, there had been many speculations regarding the Pellet Corporation. It had grown at such a rapid speed after gaining independence. The Lombardi's main guild, which had suffered from an unusual delay in production, overcame a crisis due to the deal with the Pellet Corporation. Additionally, the Surgeon District, which had been repossessed by the Empire, was also expected to be reclaimed eventually. He continued, mentioning that rumors suggested he had been aiming for this opportunity while working under Lulak. However, the Pellet Corporation had never invaded the core area of the Lombardi Guild. He had been kicked out of the manor at the time, so he didn't know exactly what happened. But perhaps Clarivan had truly helped the Lombardi Guild despite its newfound independence. Maybe his family didn't fall apart in just two years. Rather, it was likely thanks to him that it was able to remain standing for another two years. Clarivan looked at Ferentia, approached her, and began tugging at her shoes. He expressed that he wanted to request something from her. He asked her to allow him to be one of her people. Ferentia hesitated and then replied that it might be a bit difficult for him to follow her from that point onward. She advised him to be prepared for what lay ahead. The scene shifted to Ferentia and Galahan's room, where both were getting ready. While showing some options, Galahan asked Ferentia what would suit him. She made a choice, and Galahan complimented her, mentioning that he had coincidentally picked the same one. The maids were delighted to hear this. Once Galahan and Ferentia were ready, she looked at herself in the mirror and felt happy. Galahan commented that Ferentia was becoming more beautiful with each passing day. She replied that he also looked handsome. Then Ferentia thought that they were preparing for the Lombardi lunch banquet, a family event held four times a year for family unity and internal stability. She thought of her uncle, aunt, and cousin, realizing that the lunch might not have the desired effect. Nonetheless, she appreciated seeing her father dressed up for the occasion. Galahan held her hand and suggested they go. Ferentia agreed, and they stepped outside. To their surprise, they found Clarivan waiting for Galahan. Galahan asked if they had kept him waiting. Clarivan replied affirmatively, explaining it was urgent. He expressed his need to speak with Galahan, as it concerned a rollout in ten days. Ferentia mentioned that she would spend time with Giliu and Marin. Galahan responded that he would join her shortly. She advised him to finish his work first. She excused herself from Clarivan, thinking that a few weeks had passed since their last conversation. She still found it hard to believe that Clarivan had become one of her associates, and it might take years at the very least. She considered that it might be a good idea to accelerate the original plan at this rate. Vestian appeared and struck her, causing her to fall. When she looked up, she realized it was Shananette looking at her angrily. Without offering help, he continued on his way. Giliu and Marin approached Ferentia, asking if she was hurt. Giliu remarked that their father hadn't seen her and urged her to hurry. Ferentia asked if she had done something wrong. The twins looked at her and she continued, mentioning that Vestian seemed to be angry with her. The twins reassured her that it had nothing to do with her. Their father didn't have a fondness for their cousins. Ferentia inquired about their point, and one of the twins explained that since it was Ferentia, they could share the truth with her. The other twin added that it was okay because it was Ferentia. They revealed that their father had expressed his dislike for the Lombardi family, considering them to be full of irritating and foolish individuals. But Ferentia was not included in that assessment. They advised her not to share this information with anyone else, as it was a secret among the Schultz family members. Ferentia assured them that she hadn't told anyone. The twins suggested they head to where the tasty food was. As they left, Ferentia noticed her aunt seemed to know about these matters, given Vestian's conversation with Shananette. Vestian and Shananette smiled, 
and Ferentia thought to herself that Shannonette's smile didn't seem genuine. She recognized that Shannonette was a strong-willed woman who wouldn't pretend innocence like that. The scene shifted to the dining room where everyone was seated. Ferentia observed Vestian and considered that even though he hadn't officially taken on the Lombardi name as a son-in-law, he always introduced himself as Vestian Lombardi in public. This had led her to never doubt him. However, she wasn't completely certain, as in her previous life, something had happened during her aunt's divorce. Belazac and his brother playfully pelted Ferentia with grapes. Annoyed, Ferentia raised her voice and questioned Belazac's actions. The commotion caught everyone's attention, and they turned to look at her. Belazac remarked to his brother that it seemed Ferentia lacked table manners. This elicited laughter from the others. Salal commented to Galahan that Ferentia was clumsy and lacked proper manners. Visi addressed Galahan, suggesting that instead of wandering around, he should have paid more attention to Ferentia's education. Visa even mentioned that she had arranged a teacher for her. In response, Ferentia thought to herself that all of them were behaving in a disrespectful manner. Ferentia thought about whether she should return the favor or not, but arguing in front of their grandfather would have been inappropriate. Then Shannonette mentioned that she had heard that the last time Belazac was in the Emperor's presence, he had tripped over his cape and fallen. She added that it had happened before Ferentia was born, so everyone there had been quite shocked. Then Salal asked her why she was bringing that up at this time. And Visa said, Wouldn't it have been nerve-wracking for a child to stand before the Emperor? Shannonate replied that their son Belazac needed to be especially careful about learning etiquette. But instead, he had been busy running away from his lessons, claiming he already knew everything. She thought that perhaps she should have been stricter with Belazac, but he had continued to make a fool of himself. Then Salal, Vieza, and Belazac were all shocked by everything they had heard. Then Visa told her that children are allowed to make mistakes and learn from them. Shannonette felt relieved, knowing that it was correct. Ferentia being a child was the reason she was allowed to make mistakes. Ferentia thought that Aunt Shannonette's words were clearly meant as a gesture of goodwill. Then Giliou chimed in, saying that he remembered Belazac falling in front of everyone. Mayron agreed, mentioning that it must have hurt him. Giliou added that Belazac always used to cry whenever he got hurt. It must have been quite embarrassing. While eating grapes, Ferentia observed that the twins were serving Belazac in the right manner. Viese was concerned, thinking that at this rate Belazac would become the laughing stock of the family, especially in front of Galahan's daughter, and he couldn't allow this to happen. Then Visa stood and said to his father, the Duke, that he should be allowed to serve the glass of wine. The Duke granted him permission. Vieze went on to say that the fact Belazac became playmates with the prince was all thanks to their father. Salal chimed in, stating that it was a great honor for the head of the family to have such expectations for Belazac. She expressed gratitude to the Duke for allowing Belazac to enter the palace without waiting until the age of 11. Responded, saying there was no need to make a fuss and that they should consider it an early birthday gift. He added that the palace wasn't like the Lombardies, so they needed to take great precautions when visiting. Visa assured his father not to worry, mentioning that since their father had taken a special liking to Belazac, the Empress had willingly chosen him as a playmate. Therefore, no one in the palace would dare to look down on Belazac. Ferentia was certain that her grandfather's opinion of Belazac differed from her own. It was no wonder she hadn't seen him in the study room for a while. As it turned out, he had been in and out of the palace all along. By the way, about the Imperial family's playmates, they were essentially exclusive companions for the Imperial family. From a political perspective, this practice secured future authority and power. However, Ferentia wondered what was so appealing about a rotten apple. Then Duke called for Ferentia and asked her to come closer. As she approached, Ferentia pondered why her grandfather had summoned her. The Duke placed a key on the locket around Ferentia's neck, explaining that it was a birthday gift and the key to her personal library. Everyone looked on, and Ferentia couldn't help but think that this wasn't what she expected. She thought, Grandpa... My birthday gift was supposed to be a wish. 
Please don't tell me that you've forgotten. Then the Duke explained to Ferentia that her grandpa had taken a long time to personally prepare this gift, and he apologized for giving it to her only now. Ferentia understood that it was the bonus they often referred to. She thanked her grandfather for the gift and promised to study diligently and read all the books. The Duke chuckled and agreed, adding that if she needed more books, she could simply ask Brochel. He affectionately ruffled Ferentia's hair. Giglio remarked that the key was shining brightly, and Marin suggested that it could be the key to Ferentia's secret palace. Ferentia responded that she would also invite them over next time. The twins became joyful, while Belazac appeared somewhat downcast. Then Duke said to Galahan, Are you aware of the rumors that have been circulating in high society? Galahan asked, What's that? Duke replied, They all are saying that you didn't find a single marketplace anywhere, and that you were opening a store at the commoner's market. Weren't you ashamed as a Lombardi? Then Visa chimed in, saying that he had also heard about it, and while laughing, he said that they had to respect Galahan's choice. Later, Salal said to Galahan, If you have some sort of funds, I will ask them for funding. And if you utilize the family's power, you could easily arrange a store in the Sadaqui shopping district, at the very least. Then Galahan thanked them for their concerns, explaining that he was proceeding with the venture on his own without family support. But he appreciated their thoughts. Vise assured him that if he needed more funding, he would be willing to lend him money. Duke told Galahan that he was watching over him. Galahan thought it meant his father was showing his support. He replied that he would do his best and understood that his father had high expectations for him. The rest of the group sat in silence. Vestian commented that the food tasted fantastic with everyone gathered there and asked Duke Lulak if he agreed. Ferentia, after noticing the expressions of others upon hearing the news of her father opening a new shop, looked forward to their reactions. Ferentia is walking to her library that her grandpa gifted her. Suddenly, she notices guards standing in front of the library door. Ferentia greets the guards and starts to open the door to the library. As she's opening the door, she starts to think about how she wondered why the library was located in front of her grandfather's study, but now she realizes that the guards were part of the package. Ferentia successfully opens the door with her key and walks inside. Once inside, she is amazed by it. As she's touching her desk, she starts remembering about when she was sick in the past. This room used to be a place where she'd look after her grandfather's duties on his behalf. She couldn't believe that she would come back like this. All of a sudden, someone starts to knock on the library door. The person walks in, which makes Ferentia realize that it's Clarivan. Clarivan then tells her that it's a lovely place. Ferentia agrees with him and states that it's lovely for a special lesson for an honor student. Ferentia also decides to build up her power safely and soundly at this place that used to be her study in her previous life. After Clarivan is finished giving her a lesson, he says, All right, I think this is enough to understand your level of knowledge. He adds that in all seriousness, you have incredible knowledge of commerce and a sensibility that is unbelievable for an eight-year-old child. He further asks her about just when did she read The Flow of Commerce and Thilma's Economic Theory. Ferentia starts to nervously laugh upon hearing this question and wonders what her teacher means by when. She further starts to think about how since she had to take care of all the Lombardi affairs on behalf of her grandfather, she had no choice but to read them. Now that she thinks of it, it wasn't all in vain. Clarivan then tells her that, however, her knowledge of culture is a bit disappointing. Upon hearing this statement, Ferentia starts to remember about how the practical affairs and paperwork were done to the point of exhaustion. However, because she was the forgotten Lombardi, her comportment as a high-status noble and her knowledge of culture hadn't changed much since she was 11 years old. Clarivan then added that, of course, considering her age, even this much knowledge is incredibly brilliant. However, he doesn't believe that she would be satisfied with the extent of her knowledge. He further questions her about what are her thoughts. Ferentia replies, Yes, that's right. I need to possess the dignity and elegance befitting of the head of the family, after all. 
As she's clenching her hands, she also mentions to herself that she can't stay like this forever under the pretext of being young, because she's going to master this family after all. Upon hearing this response, Clarivan understands. Suddenly, he drops a bunch of books on the table. This action confuses Ferentia. Clarivan then tells her that it'd be best for her to accumulate knowledge about basic etiquette first, then proceed with the assistance of Shannonette. As Ferentia stares at the huge pile of books, she couldn't believe that this is all basic. Clarivan then claps his hands and asks her if they should start with the classics of imperial etiquette first. Upon hearing this response, Ferentia becomes nervous and wonders if she will be able to pull it off. After a while, Ferentia finally finishes reading all the books. Clarivan mentions to her that this was brilliant. He adds that she's an incredibly fast reader. Ferentia is speechless at first, and then responds, but precision is more important than speed. She also questions him if he's going to test her. Upon hearing this question, Clarivan asks her if he got caught. Ferentia ignores his question. She then takes a deep breath and states that she'll get ready. All of a sudden, she remembers that the store opening is in less than a week. This makes her ask Clarivan about if it's all right for him to spend this much time with her. As Clarivan is staring out of the window, he reassures her that he's not worried at all. We then see the next scene where Violet is instructing the workers about where to place the sign for the new store. The citizens start noticing the sign and realize that a new shop is opening. They are also amazed that a store this big is opening up at a place like this. Suddenly, Violet turns her head and greets the citizens. As she's shaking one of the citizens' hands, she tells them about how she's the manager of the Galahans' clothing store. She further requests them to visit as they're opening in a week. One of the citizens states that a young lady like her is so lively. She also asks Violet about what are they selling in there. She adds that she heard that a boutique is a store that nobles go to, but she's never heard of anything like a clothing store before. Upon hearing this statement, the citizens start to whisper amongst themselves about the store and how it's going to be very expensive. This causes Violet to tell them that they're different from the boutiques that makes bespoke clothing. She adds that they can think of it as a place where they sell ready-made clothes. This makes the citizens question her for clarification. Violet clarifies that this is correct and how they'll be able to order clothes for less than two silver coins. Upon hearing this clarification, the citizen starts to laugh and call her jokester. As they continue to laugh, they mock her as a single garment for a child is worth one silver coin alone. They further confirm with her about if she's going to scam them as soon as they walk in by mentioning to them that it's actually ten silvers. Violet responds, No, it's true. I'll be here from now on, so why on earth would I lie about that? Upon hearing this response, the citizens stop laughing and confirm with her if this is the truth. Violet reassures the citizens that it is. She adds that they're going to have to come early on the day they open because their goods will sell out very quickly. This reassurance causes the citizens to chatter amongst themselves once again. They start to become curious and wonder if they should give it a try. They eventually decide to give the store a chance. Upon hearing these positive comments, Violet gets their attention again and says, As I've told you all, the opening is in a week. She further requests the citizens not to forget to spread the word and to give them a visit. We then transition to the next scene where we see that the maids are getting Lavini ready. As Lavini is getting ready, she starts to remember about how her butler apologized to her. He stated to her that despite Galahan's appearance, he's more stubborn than he thought and how Galahan wouldn't speak of his business even by the tiniest bit. He added that he tried his best to ensure that things wouldn't turn out this way. As Lavini continues to think about Galahan, one of the maids realizes that Lavini doesn't seem to be in a good mood. She tells herself that she should be especially careful. Suddenly, one of the maids makes a mistake on Lavini's nails. Upon realizing her mistake, she fumbles to the ground and seeks for forgiveness. All of the other maids also fall to the ground and seek for her forgiveness. However, Lavini ignores all the maids as she notices one of the maids that isn't on her knees. She then mentions to the maids that all of them can leave except for the one standing. The maids agree and slam the door behind them as they're leaving. The maid that was initially standing then falls to the ground. 
Lavini then asks the maid about why she's not hearing anything from her. The maid nervously replies, Your Majesty, I, I, we're indeed using all of our powers to do as you've ordered, but... Lavini responds, Your father has recently been appointed as the Chancellor of the Court. The maid agrees to her response. Lavini then questions the maid about if she agrees that if she wishes to enjoy this good fortune, then she must take on the responsibility behind it. Upon hearing this question, the maid states to her that however, whenever she saw Perez, he was lying down in pain. She also requests Lavini for more time and wonders why Perez isn't dead yet. The maid believes that everyone would be at ease if Perez were to die. She also wishes that he would just die already. As Lavini is holding the medicine, she then tells the maid that next time she should be more generous when it comes to the amount. The maid agrees to Lavini and is relieved about the fact that she's not the one dying, but the second prince is. We then see the next scene where everyone is lining up to go inside the Gallahan clothing store. One of the workers is also mentioning to all of the customers that they may buy up to two pairs per person and how they would appreciate it if they could keep the line in order. Meanwhile, Violet shows Clarivan the sales status for the past three days. She also states that they're adding more every day, but due to several items selling out, they'll have to close early. She adds that at this rate, they're expected to run out of stock within a month. Clarivan chuckles upon hearing this statement and tells her that they should proceed with the sub-branch faster than they planned. Violet replies, The customer base has an overwhelming number of married women. She also confirms with Clarivan if this is a natural result since they know who's in charge of making the clothes. Clarivan nods in agreement and mentions to her that it sounds good. He adds that 80% of the new seamstresses that they'll hire this time will be directed to the men's clothing production. Violet becomes confused upon hearing this response and asks him if he thinks the current workers will be able to handle such an extraordinary amount of work. She adds that they've already doubled their orders for women's clothing alone at this state. As Clarivan hands her some papers, he reassures her that if it's that, then there's nothing to worry about. Violet then reads the papers that Clarivan gave her and realizes that the papers are for a clothing order from Duke Lombardi. The order is to make ready-made clothes for all the servants working at the Lombardi mansion. Clarivan starts to chuckle from seeing Violet's reaction and tells Violet to look at the back page as well. Upon hearing this statement, Violet flips to the back page and is shocked. Clarivan then says, Thanks to this, apart from the new seamstresses, we're permitted to temporarily hire tailors working exclusively for the Lombardi family under the Duke's name. Please compensate them well. Violet beams with happiness and agrees with him. She also couldn't believe that the garments will be made by the Lombardi family's craftsmen and adds that no one would be able to judge the clothes for their affordability. She further questions Clarivan about how did he come up with the idea of negotiating with the Duke. Upon hearing this question, Clarivan looks out of the window and starts to remember about how Ferentia mentioned to him that if all goes according to the order, then the Lombardi's exclusive tailors and seamstresses who are in charge of making clothes for the servants will run out. He also starts to remember about how she advised him to write a proposal to her grandfather as she knew that skilled technicians boost overall productivity. She added that if they make the servants' uniforms beforehand, then they'll be able to build skills for men's ready-made clothes. Clarivan then starts to chuckle and wonders how far ahead Ferentia was able to foresee. We then transition to the next scene where Ferentia is sitting on the couch and is drinking tea. All of the maids are also sucking up to her by offering her tea, cookies, and praising her. However, Ferentia is feeling uncomfortable from their behavior and realizes that they've been even nicer to her since the store opening. Ferentia believes that it's nice, but it's too burdensome. She feels like she's going to become spoiled rotten if this continues any longer, just like Belazac and the First Prince. Ferentia then decides to make a run for it. As she's walking away, one of the maids asks her if she's finished with her tea. Ferentia responds, Yes, I'm heading to the library. Ferentia also denies the maid to come with her as she's just going there to pick up a book she forgot. She further requests the maids to clean up the table while she's gone. The maids agree to her request. As Ferentia is walking to the library, she feels like she can breathe. 
All of a sudden, she looks out of the window and starts to think about how, since the weather's nice, she's sure it'd be all right to take some fresh air. Ferentia starts wondering how she should spend her day. She also realizes that she's been so distracted by meetings that she's been neglecting the twins. Upon realizing this, Ferentia decides to spend time with them and believes that it's their lucky day. Once she's outside and in the garden, Ferentia starts to wonder if there was a tournament hall behind this garden. She also believes that at this hour, the two twins are probably practicing swordsmanship, so it would be a good opportunity to surprise them. Suddenly, Ferentia gets hurt by someone throwing a ball at her. It hits her so hard that her nose starts to bleed. Ferentia looks over to see who threw the ball at her and realizes that it's Belazak and Astalyu. Belazak is just laughing at her and thinks it's so funny. As she's looking at Belazak, she thinks about how he's a bastard and believes that he's even more horrible since he became the first prince's playmate. She also swears at Belazak and asks him about what the hell does he think he's doing. Upon hearing this question, Belazak questions her about what did she just call him. As Ferentia grasps some sand in her hands, she tells him that even a son of a female dog is better than him. This response makes Belazak very mad. He starts approaching Ferentia to hurt her more. However, Ferentia takes this opportunity to throw the sand that she grasped in her hands earlier. The sand goes right into Belzac's eyes. Ferentia then gets up, and as she's wiping the blood off her nose, she mentions to him that he deserves it. All of a sudden, Ferentia starts to feel dizzy and falls to the ground. Upon Belazac noticing her fall to the ground, he snatches the wooden sword from Astaliu and rushes towards her to attack her as he shouts out that she's a little halfling. Ferentia starts to clench her body as she's expecting to get hurt by him and wonders if it will break her bones. She also thinks about how he can give it his best shot because she's going to make him pay for it after. Suddenly, someone knocks the sword out of Belzac's hand and whacks him. Belazak turns around to see who it is and realizes that it's the twins. The twins then rush over to Ferentia and question her about if she's all right. They also grab her from the ground as they notice that she's bleeding. One of the twins gets very angry and shouts at Belazak. However, Ferentia clasps onto his shirt and says, No, you can't hit them. As she starts to lose consciousness and the twins are asking her if she's all right, she starts thinking about how if the twins beat up those bastards, then it'll just end up being a dogfight. She also believes that now that she's bleeding, she'll go wild. Ferentia then goes unconscious. Upon the twins noticing this, one of them puts her on his back and states to the other twin that they have to bring her to the doctor immediately. Belazak is also speechless from noticing Ferentia's condition. As the twins are running to the doctor, they realize that the bleeding isn't stopping and wonder what they should do. They are also crying and swear to each other that they're going to make Belazak pay for this. We then see the next scene where Ferentia's grandfather barges into the hospital room. The doctor becomes alarmed upon seeing Ferentia's grandfather. Shannonette also walks into the room and questions the doctor about Ferentia's condition. The doctor explains to the both of them that it doesn't appear to be serious. That's what one could say. As he's fidgeting, he adds that, however, because Ferentia's head is injured, he suggests that they should keep an eye on her at all times. And fortunately, her nose isn't broken, but he also suggests that she rests as much as possible. Upon hearing this explanation, Shannonette sighs in relief. The twins also call out to their mother as they clasp her and wonder what they should do as Ferentia bled so much. Shannonette leans down and asks the twins about what happened. She further requests them to explain slowly. As the twins are sniffling, they then explain to their mother that they were on their way to see Ferentia after they finished their swordsmanship training, and that's when they heard Ferentia's voice in the garden. So they headed over there, but Belazak was beating Ferentia with a wooden sword, so they ran to her right away. Upon hearing this explanation, Shannonette is stunned to find out that Belazak hit Ferentia with a wooden sword. The twins then add that Ferentia was already on the ground, and since she was bleeding so much, they were going to hit Belazak because they were so angry. As they start sobbing even more, they further tell their mother that Ferentia told them not to hurt Belazak several times. Shannonette then clasps her children and calls out to Ferentia's grandfather. Ferentia's grandfather replies, I know. 
He also calls his butler John and commands him to bring Belazak and Astalu to his office this instant. We then transition to the next scene where Ferentia's grandfather is mentioning to Belazak about how he ignored Ferentia's pleas to stop and swung his weapon and injured her. He further asks Belazak if he understands that what he did today was absolutely unacceptable. Upon hearing this question, Belazak clenches his hand and believes that this is unfair as he's the one who got his arm broken by a wooden sword. He further wonders why is it that he should treat that half-breed Ferentia nicely in the first place as he's his father's eldest son. Ferentia's grandfather then realizes that Belazak isn't even showing signs of remorse. He tells Belazak that he must take accountability for his wrongdoings. He adds that his father will punish him for the injury that he's inflicted on Ferentia. Ferentia's grandfather also forbids him from getting near Ferentia from this time forward. He further mentions to Belazak that should he once again go against his wishes as head of the family, then he may lose his status as a Lombardi. Upon hearing these statements, Belazak becomes shocked and starts to complain. However, Ferentia's grandfather ignores him and calls out to Astalu, which alerts him. He then questions Astalu about while Belazak was swinging his wooden sword at Ferentia, why did he stand by without intervening? As Astalu is sniffling, he attempts to reply to his grandfather. However, Fiorentia's grandfather cuts him off and explains to him that a sword should only be wielded by the wise and just. He adds that he doesn't deserve to hold a sword, judging by today's incident. This response shocks Astalu. As Astalu's shaking, Ferentia's grandfather further states to him that if he does not prove himself fit to wield a sword, then his swordsmanship training will stop. Astalu is speechless upon hearing this. Ferentia's grandfather then dismisses both of them and tells them that he hopes for both their sakes that they won't be brought into his office for the same issue again. Once the two of them are outside of their grandfather's office, Astalu says, I'm heading back first. As he's walking back to his room and continues to sob, he starts to remember what his grandfather told him. Belazak then clenches his hand and starts to walk back to his room as well. As he's walking back, he believes that this is unfair and how it's him who got hurt. Yet everyone is so focused on Ferentia. Suddenly, Belazak starts to remember his grandfather's look. He quickly turns around to see if his grandfather is behind him, but realizes that there's no one there. He then grits his teeth and bangs the wall while swearing. He further mentions to himself that Ferentia should watch out as he won't just stand by passively. Belazak then starts to run. However, someone puts their sword in front of Belazak's feet, which causes him to trip and fall. As Belazak slowly gets back up, he wonders what that was. All of a sudden, someone grabs him. It turns out to be the twins, and they state to Belazak that it must hurt a lot. They also ask him about why did he trip and fall when there's nothing there. The twins further point the wooden sword at Belazak and question him about if his arm hurts a lot as they heard that it was broken. The twins then confirm with him if his arm hurts a lot. The twins are sure that a broken arm alone hurts a lot already and ask him about what does he think would happen if his leg was broken too. Upon hearing all of these statements and questions, Belazak nervously tells them to stop it. The twins reply, But if your leg was broken too, you wouldn't dare do anything bad, right? Upon hearing this question, Belazak starts to apologize to the twins and mentions to them that he won't ever do it again. However, the twins start to chuckle and call him weak and stupid. They add that he's apologizing to the wrong person. Belazak then shouts out that Grandfather forbade him from approaching Ferentia, which means that he can't get near her. Upon hearing this response, the twins chuckle and confirm with him if that's really the case. They also state that then it can't be helped. They further add that he better listen to Grandfather and to not even think about coming near their Ferentia. Belazak starts to get flustered upon hearing this threat and yells out as the twins walk away from him. Meanwhile, Visa flings the door open to Ferentia's grandfather's office and barges in. As he's walking towards his father, he calls out to him. Ferentia's grandfather states to him to take a seat. However, instead of taking a seat, he slams his hand on his table and shouts out that this is favoritism. Visa starts to complain to his father about how he's his eldest son, and Belazak is his eldest. Yet he's taking Ferentia's side. 
He adds that as if it weren't enough to snatch away his business and hand it to Galahan. But now he's making his son cower before Ferentia. And from what he's heard, he's been involved in that ridiculous clothing business of Galahan's, apparently. He further asks his father about just why on earth would Galahan even dress the servants in such lowly clothes. His father replies, A ridiculous clothing business, you say? Did it appear that way to you? Upon hearing these questions, Visa flinches. He then confirms with his father if it's simply a business for commoners at best. He also tells him that anyone can accomplish such a trivial thing. Upon hearing this statement, his father interrupts him and mentions that he should go ahead and give it a try himself. Visa becomes confused upon hearing this response. His father then explains to him that if it's so trivial and easy as he says, then he should be able to pull it off. He adds that without using the Lombardi name, he should go ahead and show everyone how he fares. Upon hearing this explanation, Visa clenches his fist and asks his father if he thinks that he's less capable than Galahan. He adds that rather than being in such a hurry for a humble sum of money, he's simply trying to build up his relations with the imperial family for something bigger. He also requests his father to think about it. Think about the inconvenience that the imperial family's isolation has caused him. He further states that, however, since the Lombardis are also part of the Empire, if they show them that the Lombardis are their ally— such isolation would be unnecessary. He adds that after all, everything he does is for him and their family. Upon hearing these statements, Ferentia's grandfather questions him for more clarification. He also tells him that while they're on the subject, it's not the imperial family that he's close to as of now. Rather, it's the Angenesis that he's close to. This response shocks Visa. He then calls out to his father, his father asks him if Jovanes, the current emperor, has ever called him in personally. He also questions Visa about if they have ever held a dinner party for him at the imperial palace and not at the empress's. Visa staggers upon hearing these questions. His father further explains to Visi that had it not been for Galahan, the business would have been used by the Angenesis to suck up the Lombardi family's assets. He then slams his table with his fist and asks him if he must say more. He also states to Visa that he's the reason why the Angenesis are still nosing around the Lombardi family's business. He further calls the Angenesis ravens that used to wander all over the West Baron before taking up the Brown family's land are beggars who obsess over one's pedigree. Ferentia's grandfather further mentions to Visi that up until this point, because he's his son, and after seeing the admirable effort he's put in, he trusted and watched him, despite the countless mistakes that he's made. So this is his first and last warning to him. He warns him to not let him reap what he has in his hands in the end. From hearing all of this from his father, Visi becomes gloomy. He also starts to tremble. His father then says, From what I've heard, the day of the Lombardi scholarship is on the same day as your imperial entrance. You better carefully consider which one to choose, the family or the ungenesis. After speaking to his father, Visa leaves his office and slams the door behind him. He starts to wonder what he should do as his entrance at the palace has already been discussed with the Empress. We then transition to the next scene where we see that Visa is really worried and questions Salal about what he should do now. He further tells her that at this rate, his father may take the Lombardi name from him. As Salal is calming him down, she requests him not to worry too much as he's the son of his father and Natalia Sershaw. She also asks him that no matter how cold-blooded his father may be, how could he possibly throw him away? Vise responds, be, But father isn't one to make empty threats. Salal is speechless at first, but then mentions to him that, of course, she's sure that his father means what he says. She further questions him that, however... Why does he think his father scolded him by going as far as mentioning Galahan? Visa replies, That's because father favors him. Upon hearing this response, Selal states that she thinks that his father's core intention lies in the fact that Galahan didn't use the power of the family. Visa asks her for more clarification. Selal clarifies by asking him that although it's a low-income business for commoners, doesn't he think that the fact that Galahan broke away from his family's power and started a business by using his own name was what deeply impressed his father? As Selal clasps his shoulder, 
Visa agrees and mentions to her that this may be so. Salal then says, Think about it, dear. Think about just how much you've tried not to go against your father's will all this time. However, people tend to get tired of what they're used to. She adds that she thinks his father now wishes him to show more initiative and whispers to him about what does he think. She further puts her hand on his face and mentions to him that if he stands firm in the face of the authority of the head of the family, then it's only natural for him to appear more reliable to his father. She adds to think of it as another test from his father, a test to see his father's real intentions. Upon hearing all of these statements, Visa agrees with Salal as he believes that what she's saying has a point. Salal then turns around to blow out the candles. As she's blowing them out, she tells Visa that the upcoming party will be held by the Empress to commemorate Belazak's assignment as the Prince's playmate. She adds that she can already vividly see the children gleaming with joy. We then see the next scene where Ferentia is waking up. Her father notices that she's waking up and questions her if she has come to. Ferentia replies by asking her daddy about where she is. Her father responds, We're in your bedroom. You were unconscious for most of the day. Upon hearing this response, Ferentia understands. Her father then questions her if she feels dizzy and asks her if she's hurt anywhere. Ferentia reassures him that she's fine. She also starts to wonder how things went as she believes that half a day is enough time for things to have already concluded. Suddenly, Ferentia's father puts his hand on her face and states that he's heard everything from the twins about how Belzac hit her with a wooden sword. Her father adds that despite that, she tried stopping the twins to protect the children that hurt her. Upon hearing these statements, Ferentia is confused and starts to think about how that's not what really happened and knows that she's in this state because she got hit by a ball. Ferentia's father then hugs her and tells her that he understands and knows exactly how she feels. He also questions her about how is she so kind. As Ferentia's father is hugging her, she realizes that what the twins saw was that Belazak was brandishing a wooden sword at her. She also wonders if the adults just took what the twins told them and misunderstood the whole thing. She further believes that she's hit the jackpot thanks to this. Please make sure to subscribe. Special thanks to all of my Patreon members. Why not watch another manhole recap on my channel by clicking on this video right here?